Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! It would seem the Pokemon fever continues! I've got a big project for you guys today, literally! We're tackling one of the three legendary aura trio, Xerneas, the life Pokemon. I get powerful spiritual tree of life vibes from Xerneas' design and story arc in the games and movie. Reminds me of the forest god from Princess Mononoke, actually. Both are from Japanese creators, so I can only assume there must be a creature like that in Japanese mythology. What about the other two legendaries, Yveltal and Zygarde, you ask? Well, I've teamed up with fellow doll artists and Pokemon lovers alike, Doll Motion and the Doll Fairy, to bring you the complete set of Generation 6 XYZ Legendary Trio. But for now, let's make Xerneas. In my earliest sketches, I imagined reconstructing most, if not all, of the doll from scratch. I sketched a few outfit concepts, but decided clothing masked too many of the doll's signature design elements. Because I did plan on focusing primarily on body modifications, I figured an outfit wasn't too important anyway. I briefly considered a centaur-like design using Avia Trotter as a base, but I really want this doll to tower over my Eevee dolls, so I decided to use the 17-inch Frightfully Tall Ghouls line Frankie Stein doll as a base. You can see from these sketches, I intended for her to have a smaller head, more proportional than the usual exaggerated doll forms I work with. One of my goals of 2018 is to sculpt my own ball-jointed doll from scratch, so I was getting a little carried away. I reeled myself back in a bit to just heavily modifying an already beautifully designed 17-inch Monster High doll instead. This discrepancy of changing my mind on the head size caused problems towards the end of the project, but we'll get to that later. Bring on the doll! These tall dolls really are impressive. If you've never seen one from this line, they're not just scaled up, but also have more complicated joints, allowing for a beautiful range of posing. Time to get started! First, I'm going to take off the head like I do with the smaller dolls. This might have been a mistake, but hey, live and learn. It took longer for the thicker head to get squishy. When it finally did, I tried my best to tug it off. The neck peg came clean out of the neck without breaking somehow. I hear stories from lots of other customizers talking about how easily the neck peg breaks or comes off on these big dolls, and I suppose I'm no exception. It'll be fine. Next up, I'm going to cut around Frankie's hairline with a box cutter. I tried pulling out all the plugs, but those things are really stubborn. Good enough. This separated headpiece will become a key component in Xerneas' design. It gives us access to inset eyes, creates the base for her horns and hair, and also acts as the removable casing for the electronic component. In other words, I've pinned a lot of hopes and dreams onto this chunk of plastic. So yes, you heard right, inset eyes this time. Moonlight Jewel did it recently on her beautiful Valentine doll, and of course, I love Mia's Daydreams dolls. I think we all consider her the master of inset eyes. I mark new eye shapes onto the doll first, because I won't be following the mold. I want Xerneas' eyes to be set further apart and tilted. Using a sharp new blade, go slowly and make repetitive cuts as opposed to cutting through in one go, and of course be careful. Mia's daydream, give me strength! The thicker plastic on these heads means the width is too great for eyes to sit close to the surface, so you'll have to whittle that down as well. It certainly wasn't easy. Here's a comparison of one eye whittled thinner on the inside and one after it's just been cut. They aren't the cleanest, but I tried. Now for some purely structural modifications. The head is going to bear a lot of weight, and we can't have the crown falling off, so first I mark the connected pieces in pencil. Then I drill two holes inside the markings. Taking a 20 gauge wire, I weave in and around the holes for a strong connection at the temple. Then make a loop shape. Double check the alignment, then drill a hole into the crown. We want to make sure the hole passes through the wire loop. Looking good. To complete the inner structure, I take my favorite two-part epoxy sculpt, mix equal parts together, and mush them around the armature wire. As long as it fits into the curvature of the head, it doesn't have to be pretty. I set a nut into the epoxy, 
try it back on to make sure it aligns with the hole and allow it to cure completely. After hardening, we can screw in from the outside, making a super strong connection for these two pieces. The body mods get pretty crazy too. Well, you saw the concept art. There's a couple pieces we need to separate and reconstruct. Using a jeweler saw, I mark and then saw clean off the lower legs, mid torso, neck, and eventually the upper and lower arms too. I was actually inspired by Doll Motion's incredible body molding on her Krampus doll to try something a little crazy myself. Oh dear, what have I done? Here's all the pieces, and it's interesting to get a glimpse into the construction of these big dolls, isn't it? I didn't know what would be in there, so I just got lucky there was plastic bars I could anchor the wire around. It's grown on me since I first saw it, but one thing I never cared for on Monster High dolls is the swayback look. It seems more noticeable on these big dolls, so I thought I'd straighten up her posture a bit just for fun this time. Using the structures inside the doll, as well as some holes I drilled myself, I wove the armature wire in and around all throughout the pieces to connect them. I make a loop shape for the lower legs because those will become a joint piece. It should be pretty sturdy if woven around, but I added epoxy glue for extra measure inside all the connected areas. Because she's a bigger doll, the modifications will be weightier, so we need the extra strength so she won't fall apart on us. So we've torn apart a doll and put her back together. Was Frankie Stein the right doll to use for this project or what? Let's fill in the gaps with more good ol' epoxy. We'll be using a lot of it on this doll. First pass is just to fill in space and bulk it up. When it comes to the leg joint piece, I fill it in and try to keep it flat on both sides, like a coin. Before it cures, I push a hole through the center. This is where a screw will pass through later. It's so cold the epoxy is taking forever to cure. Cure faster, darn it! The second pass of epoxy is the fun part. This is when we can sculpt and make cosmetic changes to our liking. I want Xerneas to have a bigger booty and thighs reminiscent of the powerful haunches a deer has. Dip a finger in water and stroke the surface to smooth out and flatten the epoxy. I also fleshed out the neck to cover up all the weird bumps, and I do this on the rest of the pieces as well. The face gets some cosmetic changes too. To match the Pokemon and to give off a more mysterious vibe, I add strips of epoxy above the eyelids and down the slope of her nose. You can use the spinning motion of a toothpick as well as a round rubber eraser to blend and smooth epoxy into the doll's face. I found the eraser quite helpful this time for achieving graceful curves around the inner corners of the eyes that my fingers just couldn't reach. I decided ears would be a good idea. Xerneas doesn't have ears per se, but these blue horn things? But she's going to have eight horns already, which seems like enough, so I interpreted these as ears for my doll. Now for the lower legs. I'll be constructing this entire piece. So starting with a tongs-shaped armature wire, I make two more coin-shaped pieces as similar in size as possible to the piece attached to the leg. I use a skewer to ensure all the holes line up with each other. I let these parts cure completely before filling in the rest of the leg shape because we can still shift around the wire to make sure those holes alignment is perfectly parallel. This footage got lost, so let me explain. To make the rest of the leg, I extended the shapes down with more wrapped up wire. Because epoxy is heavy and expensive, I filled in the bulk of the shape with an inexpensive lightweight air dry clay. I made all of this with the legs screwed together so that nothing important would shift out of place while I worked. With the base of the leg formed, now we can come back on top with our higher quality material to shape and sculpt Xerneas' pointy legs and feet. I am being quite careful around the discs as not to obstruct the joint. Just as with the other body molds, I take it slow and go in layers. 
You can sand epoxy after it's cured to round out bumps and smooth it further if the water didn't do the trick. I picked up a few heavy duty tools known as rasps for this project. The toothy metal grate sands it down fast, so I used that first, then switched to the finer sandpaper until everything's nice and smooth. Similar to the structure on the head, we want to set a nut into the epoxy. It will be permanent and hidden inside the ankle structure of each leg. So step one, screw together the hinge joint. Step two, encase the nut side of the joint in epoxy. Step three, use snakes of epoxy to coil around the screw's head, hiding the screw but still making it accessible. Note that I have oriented the screws to face the inner leg so they are more out of sight. Guess what's next? More epoxy! I was so focused on the joints I'd forgotten to add the designs around her knees, chest, and elbows, as well as these cute little horns for eyebrows. Basically, while one section was curing, I'd switch and work on another part, so there was lots of back and forthing happening. After about five passes, I think I'd gotten all the designs and shapes just right on the legs. You can see here that this is the maximum amount of movement it can do, which isn't great. So I sawed off more of an angle on the leg and patched it back up. That's better. Looks sleeker too. One last mod worth mentioning before we move on. The new eyelids I added to her face re-thickened the mold, naturally, so I've got to go in and thin it out again if we want to do the inset eyes. Epoxy is much harder than plastic, so I'm going in with my Dremel tool. It rapidly spins a small sandpaper-like tip for detailed and accurate sanding. I reckon you could still do this by hand with rasps and sanding sticks if you didn't have the power tool, but it sure is easier. Wow, that's all the body modifications finished. Let's coat her with primer using the airbrush. It took me two passes for an opaque coverage with the primer paint. Not only does it fully conceal both plastic and epoxy, but it will make the doll more receptive to acrylic paints. It's fun to watch the epoxy mods blend into the plastic and become one piece, isn't it? Don't forget to bend the knees, shoulders, hips, etc. to coat all those places. And find a good place to dry the pieces, of course. Yeah, doll customizing is a weird hobby, guys. Here's the body sprayed. It looks so clean. Taking acrylic paint, I mix up a light warm beige. This is the color of her accent parts on the legs, chest, and arms. If you paint many, many layers of watery acrylic on top of each other, you'll achieve a smooth finish. If you brush it like I did and use a viscous mixture, you'll probably end up with some brush strokes. Although if you're careful, you can sand down acrylic with a fine grate sandpaper. Her entire lower half is black. I enjoy the Liquitex brand acrylics for their creamy, buttery quality. Black always covers well and with one coat in my experience. For a subtle color shift, I'm adding dark blue to the tips of the black areas on her feet, although I'm not sure the camera even picks it up. Her upper half is an ultramarine blue. The swiveling upper arm and leg joints added some extra challenge for painting. It wanted to scrape off immediately, so we'll have to come up with a solution for that later. To make the blue look less plasticky, I guess, let's paint on a fluffy texture by mixing in some white and using small, quick strokes. To seal in the paint, I add two layers of DuraClear matte varnish. This stuff does a really great job of protecting the color from chipping, although more often than not it dries shiny, not matte like the bottle says. Face up time! I thought about using the airbrush more, but it's really cold outside and I was like, nah, we can do this with a brush. Referencing the artwork off screen, I paint on her blue skin and leave negative space for the beige. I take more care watering down the paint this time, since it is her face, the main event. It's subtle, but I added a gradation of lighter blue at the front of her face to darker blue in the back with the extremities fading to a darker blue. 
I also shaded the temples and under her nose. Once the blues on her face are opaque, we can paint details on the eyelids and add eyeliner. I start by darkening the wings of the outer eye. I accentuate her main heavy eyelid and also draw a short wrinkle for detail. Using shades of blue, I darken the inner corner to imitate depth and add highlights to the lid to make it seem round and defined. Don't forget the waterline. Seems more obvious for the cutout eyes, doesn't it? Seems like I shouldn't go much further until I fill in the beige strips. This gives me a chance to correct any wobbly edges in the blue. Careful around the horns. Or eyebrows. Horn brows? The acrylic on its own looks pretty good, but for more subtle shading, I'm brushing on a dark blue pastel color near the inner corners of her eyes, and also on her nose and lips and any other place that needs more definition. I had not sealed her, but because I used pastel, I did seal her with Mr. Super Clear at this point. After 30 minutes for the sealant to dry, I mixed up the four pastel colors found on the Pokemon and added decorations to her forehead, as well as the deer spots along her back. The body and head are now painted! But look, the body did end up very shiny, while the head is a nice matte. I didn't like how that looked together, so I sprayed the body with Mr. Super Clear too, and voila! Much nicer. She's all the same texture right now, so let's add some variety by gluing faux fur to her body in strategic places. There's that scraped off area. Now completely obscured. She's also going to receive a fluffy tail, so I want to add lots of fur around her hindquarters for a smooth transition, and a more modest look for that matter. I added some fur to her hips as well, but do be careful not to glue anything on top of articulated moving parts. Let's reattach to her finished legs. You'll see I'm including a thin cardboard disc between the joints, just for a little extra padding so it's not hard epoxy on epoxy. And screw it in place. I quite like this design, because if the legs start to get floppy in the future, I can just tighten the screws to make them stiff again. Let's make her tail. Use whatever wire you've got left to create the armature, and using the same faux fur from earlier, I sketched the basic shape on the back in white pencil. After cutting out two pieces, face right sides together and stitch down the back of the tail. Normally I'd sew all the way around and turn it, but the long fur is difficult to work with so I stitched the majority from the outside. I know it just shows up as a black blob on the screen, so sorry about that. Give it a trim to match the shape, then paint the blue stripe on top, and it's done. Drill into the back and set the wire inside with more epoxy glue. And we're coming up on 19 minutes already. This is not only a huge doll, but a huge project as well, so I will catch you in part two. Annyeong!